region during this, that flyby in 2005. And we see these four diagonal fractures, huge fractures about 80 miles long, cutting across the South Polar region. Um, and when you superimpose the heat map on top of that, on the right-hand side, you see that there is a lot of heat coming out from just that same area as where the fractures are. We uh, saw temperatures as high as about minus 200 Fahrenheit, which sounds awfully cold, and it is, but the background temperature of the surface is less than minus 300 Fahrenheit. So these things really stood out as warm compared to that very cold background. And so it seemed like there was heat coming out of the interior of Enceladus. So on this new flyby, having made this discovery last time, we really wanted a closer look. And what we did is, from much closer to Enceladus, after Hunter made his measurements, we were able to scan that region inside the white box uh, to see more detail. And the next graphic shows what we found. This is now the new data from that region inside the white box, showing now we see the heat coming out along each of those fractures individually. We see a great deal of detail here. We see a continual line of, of heat radiation along the fractures, but a lot of variation, some areas being much brighter than others. We see some areas that are not on these main tiger stripe fractures at all, but up in the right-hand corner, there's interesting other stuff going on. This is a beautiful map of where the action is on the south pole of Enceladus. Um, now, the composite infrared spectrometer doesn't just take images like this, we get a spectrum at every point, and that allows us to measure the temperature fairly precisely. And we just happened to get lucky that our best data was over the brightest tiger stripe, um, that's what we call these fractures, down in the lower right corner. And so there we were able to get a nice temperature measurement, and we saw temperatures as high as minus 135 degrees Fahrenheit, which again sounds pretty cold, but this is enormously higher than the background temperature, less than, 300 Fahrenheit, less than minus 300 Fahrenheit, and means we have a great deal of energy being delivered to the surface in this region. Um, and so this is really interesting because if we're seeing temperatures up to minus 135 degrees on the surface, we know it's going to be even warmer below that. And it's not out of the bounds of possibility that somewhere down below we're getting temperatures up approaching the uh, temperature of liquid water. Whatever is producing this heat on the surface is going to be producing even more heat underneath. So we're not seeing liquid water or those temperatures, but we're Everything we see, as the closer we look, the more energy we see, the higher temperatures we see, and it's entirely possible that there's going to be liquid water not too far below the surface of these warm fractures. Um, now, we have other data that we've taken recently with the Cassini cameras, uh, which allows us to locate exactly where these geysers are coming out of, and the last graphic shows those uh, locations. This is from previous work done by the Cassini imaging team, showing the main sources of the jets coming out of the South Pole, these geysers. And you see that there's quite a nice correlation with where the heat is coming out. Um, the, the fractures tend, the plumes tend to be coming out of the warmest points on the fractures. And so we're really beginning to get this very comprehensive picture. We have images of the surface to see the geo geology. We can see where the plumes are coming from. We can see where the heat is coming from. Other Cassini instruments are measuring the composition of the surface directly. Um, but we have even more ways of, of observing the plume and uh, because there's so many wonderful instruments on Cassini that can look at the plume in so many different ways. And Larry Esposito will talk about some new results from another of the Cassini instruments. Yes, thank you, John. So I'd like to talk about the results from the ultraviolet imaging spectrograph. And that sort of investigation is a little bit different from the previous two. Instead of going into the plume and measuring it as Hunter did or looking at the surface and measuring that with a spectrometer. Instead, we watch a star as it passes behind the plume. And in the visual that you're seeing here, the horizontal green arrow shows the path of the star behind the plume. And as the star passes behind the plume, its starlight becomes dimmer, which allows us to measure the shape and the structure and also the composition of the plume. And as the star passes behind, we're able to turn this into a picture and a direct measurement of the environment of the plume very near the surface. So this is something that Cassini has not been able to do yet to penetrate into the heart of the plume, which is measured by watching a star that passes behind. If we go to the next slide, uh, we'll see an animation here. And this is an animation of what you would see from the Cassini spacecraft. That's the star Zeta Orionis, one of the stars in Orion's belt, passing behind the uh, 
plumes there. And we need the audio for this, if we could turn the audio up on that. And as you see, the star dims as it passes behind each of the jets in the plume. That sound you're hearing is like a tea kettle. We're watching steam come out of the southern pole of Enceladus. And each of the jets, if we go back one more time for the animation, please. If we go back, please, to the animation. If we could uh, step back to the animation, thank you. So as the as the stars, Ada Orianus passes behind. Where the exiting gas is larger, the star dims, and we're able to measure, actually count, the number of molecules along the path to the star. And so this gives us the most detailed the most detailed measurements of the physical properties of the jets near the surface. And here's an artist's conception in this graphic of the jets coming off of the surface of Enceladus. The blue line with the arrow that proceeds from right to left is the path of the star as projected onto the surface of Enceladus. And each of those little letters, A, B, C, D, is one of the times that we see the dimming of the star increase that shows us the presence of a small jet coming off the surface of Enceladus. And as you can see from this visual, our observations A, B, C, and D roughly line up with the jets that have been observed by the cameras, the same ones that were indicated by stars in John Spencer's last visual. So there's a consistent story here that the cameras are seeing jets of gas lifting small grains of ice from the surface of Enceladus, and we are able to match those observations by watching a star that passes behind the moon. <clears throat> the, uh, the next uh, visual here is not of Enceladus, but of the old faithful geyser at Yellowstone. So this is the best analogy we have on the Earth to the phenomenon that's occurring on Enceladus. Just like on Enceladus, water is shooting out of the surface of the moon. And uh, there are, however, a few differences between Old Faithful, the geyser on the Earth, and the geysers that we're seeing on Enceladus. On Enceladus, there is no atmosphere. The sky is black, full of stars. The jets are continuous and not liquid water, but water vapor, essentially steam. And the particles entrained captured in that water are small grains of ice, about one ten thousandth of an inch across. And so now, with the combination of the direct measurements, uh, the remote measurements, and the occultation by a star, we're getting a picture of the environment that's creating these jets on the surface of Enceladus. Water molecules ejected at over a thousand miles per hour, carrying small grains of ice, ten thousandth of an inch across, shooting hundreds of kilometers above the surface of the moon Enceladus. Fortunately, this gas and the small particles are not a danger to Cassini, and therefore we'll be able to use the spacecraft to go yet closer to the moon and do yet more detailed investigations. We see on Enceladus the three basic requirements for the origin of life. We see water, although it may not be liquid. We see organic compounds detected by the ion and neutral mass spectrometer. And we also have a source of heat indicated by the composite infrared spectrometer. These three basic ingredients are, provide a minimum for the origin of life. Now we don't yet see, nor can we tell or state whether the interior of Enceladus contains liquid water and if that water might be a habitat for life. But these are the questions that Cassini